Today's video is brought to you by Audible. There are many reasons why Audible is a great service, but most of all, it can save you a lot on the newest 40k audiobooks. You can get a free audiobook of your choice plus two Audible originals using my link. Please be sure to check it out at audible.com forward slash Luton. At the end of the video, I'll cover some audiobook choices that I think you should give a listen to. You to even ask that, it suggests to me you have never bore witness to such machines, such engines of war. We all saw it, the limitless power. Fear, to call it that is an understatement. Many of us felt, I suppose I have to be truthful to you, don't I? We felt worthless. We'd fought hard for many weeks, but at this sight, all became silent. Without warning, the blast came. The sound was just deafening. Many garden line were knocked from their feet. Some were even screaming, their bones broken, we guessed, by the shockwave as it passed over. And the heat. It felt like we had Promethium just showered onto us. Those who had exposed skin, it was just burned away. Others on the ground, they thought they were on fire. We could see they were not. The light from the blast, the energy, it was so powerful, so bright. You could see through your own hands. What weapon could do that? We looked out and we saw the weapon hit the enemy far off in the distance. We knew we should have felt jubilant, but we were not. Many guardsmen, they were even crying, but in total silence. They were frozen. They were simply overcome, you understand. The sight of such a machine, such a weapon. Some of us had heard the rumors, spirits and the ancient machines, you know. None of us thought we should ever see such a machine. A god of war. If we build such things, why do we fight? Why do so many die? To witness it. To even think that such war engines could exist. I think for many of us, it was just beyond comprehension. One of the core features that defines the galaxy of the 41st and 42nd millennium for its inhabitants is its scale. Events range from minor gang skirmishes in the lower levels of mankind's hive cities, where each individual, each bullet, each sector of territory is of critical value to those who inhabit its darkened and polluted cityscapes. Twisted power struggles between human administrators and overseers of the Imperium's infrastructure remain, much as similar aspirational power battles have throughout all of human history. The men and women who survive galactic wars as members of humanity's Imperial Guard know this fact all too well. Few of those guard could even begin to imagine the scale of battle they would one day bear witness to and participate in. While many battles for the Imperium can be fought on a small scale defending outposts or even moderate cities, many more engagements will be between armies where infantry will number into the millions or even tens of millions. Humanity has developed to a point where it has such a massive scale of human manpower available that when it's faced with wars on this truly apocalyptic scale, the worth of an individual begins to diminish to a point of complete apathy. A single soldier seems far less significant when tens of thousands are often lost in one day. In such battles, any guardsmen who may for a moment turn their gaze away from the horror and look upward, likely during an especially brutal engagement of critical importance, only then may they be lucky enough to catch sight of towering constructions they never could have imagined were possible. Vast bipedal war machines that for any Imperial citizen must appear to be quite literally gods of war. Standing frozen in stunned awe, any such guardsmen would share a rare privilege of bearing witness to what are the god engines of the Imperium. Some of the most powerful weapons in existence, the Titans of the Adeptus Mechanicus. 
The origins of the titanic war machines of the Imperium is unsurprisingly deep in humanity's past, and similarly to many other historical events for those living in the 41st millennium, these events of significance are obscured by a clouded past making them difficult to fully describe with accuracy. In many instances the details of humanity's history becomes misunderstood or misrepresented, the cause of such things often being semantics and how any one person may choose to interpret the meaning of a specific account or reference. One of the most contentious examples being how it is commonly said that Titans were created during the Age of Strife on Mars and not created during the Dark Age of Technology, and the key word there being created. At the same time, it's also said unlike almost any other piece of technology within the Imperium that the Mechanicus construct Titans without the use of STC. That is to say, without clear schematics or blueprints of a sort, that they just know how to make it through maybe handed down information. And this is a detail that I take issue with, and I personally believe this is not specifically accurate. I spent a good deal of time searching through just about every reference that I could think of, and I was unable to find any source which supported this description with any clarity. Although this is certainly not definitive, I don't claim to be infallible, I could have missed a source, so as always if somebody has one, a literal source with a reference and an actual page, please point me in its direction. And no, the wiki doesn't count. One reason this took me so long to bring together was I actually got quite hung up on this specific detail and looking through a huge amount of material, yet found very very little, if any, specific reference to this detail. In fact, the references I did find actually point quite surprisingly to the opposite situation. That in fact, STCs most certainly do play a role and have played a role in the construction of Titans, which really goes against the grain. But when you think about it objectively, that makes plenty of logical sense. Because when you think about it, doesn't it seem somewhat conflicting from a logical point of view that the Mechanicus and the Imperium, who struggle to make any major piece of hardware without remnants of an STC, and yes, there's religious reasons, but still. Yet here we are presented with this idea that these same figures within the Mechanicus are able to build Titans, some of the very most advanced technology that exists within the Imperium, they can build these from scratch with purely handed down knowledge. As I say, I found nothing that clearly supports this, only vague mentions that could be very easily interpreted in multiple different ways, but beyond that, it also just doesn't make any sense to me either. I find it very difficult to believe given the nature of the far future, with all the disruption that has happened to the Imperium across 10 millennia, that the stable working knowledge of constructing Titans could be held simply through passed down knowledge, yet they still require STC designs to construct far more simple machines. Now let me also say there is certainly a caveat here, which is that the Mechanicum and the Mechanicus both arose out of this sense of handed down knowledge, that the tech priests were the survivors of Mars who were able to keep things functioning, and thereby were those who had survived the apocalypse on Mars during the Age of Strife. Except that this did not mean that they were creating vast war machines. It meant that they were keeping water and oxygen infrastructure operational. I think you have to give some fair credit here though as well to the Mechanicus because while much of what they do is probably fairly restrained because of their religious views, we do know that the Mechanicus can invent and create new things as evidenced by figures like, say, Belisarius Call or Coriel Zeth, who attempted to create a machine that would enable her to access all of the knowledge of humanity and mankind that existed in the warp, the sum total of knowledge. The fact that the Mechanicus keep machines operational and even adapt them means that there is inherently a fairly solid understanding of science and engineering, and you also have the engineers as well as the tech priests. At the same time, it should be remembered that most of what they do is more like well understood maintenance. They aren't drawing out schematics for things from scratch. It's like if you go to a mechanic in a garage, as I've used this analogy before. You know, he knows how the machine works. He can fix it, he can identify problems, he knows how to solve those specific issues to keep it maintained and running well. He can even repair damage to it. But what he couldn't do is draw up from scratch a brand new machine that functions exactly like that car. Couldn't necessarily reverse engineer and all this kind of thing. So it becomes especially difficult when you consider that Titans contain some of the most advanced AI, in air quotes, that exists. Not to mention just their sheer scale and the complexity of creating a means of interfacing a human mind with a machine spirit. This is technology which has been around, again, since the Dark Age, the Golden Age. 
so it's a very cloudy puzzle indeed and I found nothing to clarify it greatly. Happily, this is often the case with 40k source material, much of what you want to know is merely alluded to and talked about in vague, very non-specific anecdotes and accounts from memory. It's just the way it goes, sometimes there simply is no straight answer. When it comes to the origins of Titans, the assumption usually goes that there was no need for machines like Titans prior to the Mars War during the Age of Strife, to which I immediately say, what? This seems fairly obviously untrue. When you consider directly prior to this time, the galaxy of humanity was being consumed amid a cataclysmic war with the Men of Iron, which was by all accounts on a devastating scale far bigger than anything which has taken place in the 41st millennium. This happened just prior to the Age of Strife, not to mention any number of threats humanity faced, and this is after all why the Imperial Knights were developed to defend human colonies by STC systems. So it seems fairly feasible to me that even if some STC became corrupted around this period, others may well have designed essentially what are scaled up knights after all. And that seems fairly reasonable, does it not? Most STC tend to output designs that are just scaled up versions of whatever smaller thing they already designed, so it honestly doesn't seem to be a big leap to put two and two together on that concept. Incidentally, the origin of Night Worlds I have found in relation to this is often worded in a way that, like many things in 40k, can sound somewhat of a contradiction depending on where you read it. For example, both 8th edition versions of the Titanicus rulebook and Imperial Knights Codex talk about the origin of Night Worlds. But the Titanicus description is worded to sound as if these night worlds occurred only as a result of the Mechanicum sending out its colony vessels. Quoting the description, it states how this was how planets became the so called night worlds. Now, this really could have been worded more clearly to explain that these worlds became specifically the Mechanicum night worlds. So, you see, it's not an untrue statement, but there were other night worlds already which existed long before the Mechanicum decided to send its colony ships forth. And my point simply being, this is an example of a common lack of clarity which all too often leads people to become easily confused and make wrong assumptions about what's happening at what time, in where and by who. So when it comes to Titans, another point of issue is that we know Titans originally contained powerful self-aware AI, of the kind we know were readily used during the Dark Age of Technology. At some point later down the line, the AI as used in Titans by the Mechanicus and the Imperium were downgraded, but are still sentient to a degree, just not completely independent, true AI. However, they walk just about as close to the line as could be tolerated for what we constitute to be an AI. In order to fully function, Titans in the Age of the Imperium needs to be crewed by human pilots, the Princeps. The first iterations of AI within Titans appear by all accounts to have shared a spirit of independence, very similar to the ship The Spirit of Eternity from the novel Death of Integrity, which had formed a bond with its captain. The AI ship still appeared to be emotionally traumatised many years later by the Imperium's torture and execution of its captain. This makes plenty of sense when you think about it, as both these AI originated from the same age, and this example of a Titan STC AI is from the novel Dark Adeptus, where the Grey Knights discover what is known as a Castigator class Titan. Now, no known Castigator class Titan actually exists in the Imperium. It's not by design of the Mechanicus. This specific Titan was also described as having a different physical configuration to any other Imperial Titan, specifically with its head above the body, not hanging out from the front of the body. This suggests it to be an earlier version than those used by the modern Mechanicus and the Imperium. As the AI specifically talks about itself in relation to STC, it's fairly reasonable to conclude it is based on STC technology. Also, because the Castigator class Titan contained a self-aware AI, similar to the ship The Spirit of Eternity, it was able to speak directly and converse to a Grey Knight with clarity about what it actually believed itself to be, its intentions and more importantly, when it was made. The machine tells us, not one of you can understand what I am. When I was made, it was to teach you how to build the body you see around you so you could use it in your petty wars but I saw long, long ago that it would not be enough. My mind is composed of so much information that I could form it into thoughts far more complex than any idea your minds can encompass. Buried beneath the surface of this world, I came to conclusions of my own about what I was made for and what I could truly be. That is why I ruled this world. 
This initially seems to be quite vague, but the Titan AI elaborates for us. Yes, I was created in a time which even I cannot recall and has been lost to your Imperium. From the historical records on Charnia, I could piece together nothing but legends and guesswork about the Golden Age, the time you call the Dark Age of Technology. There I was made so that in this future, your people could build this machine. But in the wars that followed, I was lost. The information I contained was used to create inferior copies, built too quickly and modified too heavily. Now, this description alone should fairly obviously suggest that Titans originate from the Dark Age of Technology just in a somewhat different format. They were not truly developed on Mars during the Age of Strife, but they were copied, duplicated and modified in this time to serve the purposes required by the Tech Priests. So yes, they were created in this period, in the sense that they were constructed, albeit from a design that according to the Castigator was heavily modified and something of a rush job likely out of necessity designed specifically for an age of war. Yet I wouldn't say they were truly created in this period as it seems more than evident that they had at least been initially designed during the Dark Age for whatever reason. This is unknown. Now before anybody jumps on me and says, well hang on LT, you said before never just use one reference to determine something. I agree, I often say this, so here's some more. There are other references, for example, the discovery of pieces of STC tech specifically designed for Titans. This is from Priests of Mars. Each of these linked machines have been developed from technology designed to rouse the plasma reactors of Titans to full readiness in the shortest time possible. An almost complete STC discovered by Magos Floston less than half a millennium ago had described the construction of such kickstarters but its missing fragments had contained the information required to prevent such devices from driving their reactors into uncontrolled critical mass in a matter of seconds. Thus the designs were archived instead of being put into production. So that's one instance, but there's also another where a young commissar Yarek is discussing with Inquisitor Kraus as to the nature of a titan-like machine mysteriously constructed by a chaos cult that they have been sent to quell. This machine was distorted and a hellish abomination. Its appearance caused them to question how such a thing could even have been created. The Inquisitor speaking first. You are being ridiculous. I am not talking about means, I am talking about knowledge. I have seen the hololiths, it is not the product of any standard template construct known to me. Or am I foolishly ignorant? Am I wrong? Yarek. No, you are not. No STC had ever made such a monster, especially one whose throne was a terrible mockery of the principles that animated Titans. So again, more discussion around STCs in regard to machines that are not meant to be at all constructed using STCs. My big issue with the statement that Mechanicus construct Titans without STC and purely retain knowledge that they just created these things out of necessity and you know they had the cause and the means, first, it makes very little logical sense. I find it hard to balance the fact that the Mechanicus are capable of simply losing the knowledge of how to construct some machines that the Imperium have possessed, yet which are apparently far more straightforward to construct than a Titan, yet at the same time, the general belief seems to be that they have retained this knowledge on not only how to construct Titans across literally 10,000 years, but they also have created the AI for those machines. For me, it just doesn't make sense, but what does make sense in 40k. Also, by the way, they have lost the knowledge on how to make some titans as well. But there is also the fact that in my searching, I really found no reference which explicitly states this, or even close to explicitly states this. It's a lot of generalization. And apart from, yes, it does say on the wiki, but I poured through novels and rule books and texts and the epic stuff and Titanicus and obscure material from decades ago. I went through a lot of material and I found no reference to the Mechanicus exclusively building titans from retained knowledge. I found plenty of course describing in general terms that they do build them. But that's like saying the Mechanicus build tanks in Forge Worlds. It's literally as vague a description as that. It's no more clarity. If we're thinking about the idea of the Mechanicus constructing Titans just with their own knowledge, it helps to have a little further perspective on just why this is so hard to believe. It's true that on the face of it, Titans may seem to us to be not especially complicated. What is a Titan? A big bipedal machine with two huge guns? What's so complex with that? Well, for starters, let's remember that they have very powerful plasma reactors to enable them to use multi-layered void shields. Titans are far more powerful than most Imperium technology. In fact, they exhibit the highest levels of humanity's current technology. 
For example, it is said that the Titan Legions, known as the Warp Runners, are believed to actually be capable of teleporting into battle. That's right, Titans teleporting into battle, which as you might imagine would have a fairly profound visual impact on whatever enemies they were deploying to encounter. Fairly sure the phrase that would come to mind would be immediately run away. At a more basic level though, think about how much of the rest of the Imperium or even the Mechanicus itself operates. Most Imperial starships still require sheer manual labour to load their weapon systems. Most complex machines and infrastructure in the Imperium rely on significant amounts of manpower to help them function. So for even a Titan like the smaller Warhound to function with just a crew of four is really something of a miracle. But then you come to the true miracle of the machine, its spirit. There really are very few things in the Imperium that are comparable to the machine spirit of a Titan. Just how such a thing is created is not specifically known, most probably for good reason. But it is referenced that they use Terran animals' mental pattern functions, often those with an aggressive spirit, which is then suppressed behind multiple barriers of logic processors and various coded elements. How is it that the Mechanicus are able to create such a mind? This in and of itself is highly questionable. Of course, there are very advanced members within the Mechanicus, but generally speaking. And the Titan AI is not truly sentient in the sense of how we would understand those AI from the Golden or the Dark Age of Mankind. However, they are certainly more aware and involved than the machine spirit of, say, a Land Raider, which is very much just something akin to an instinctual system. It's not truly aware of itself. Whereas a Titan AI, for example, will actually dream when they are not in use. Lowly crew have observed Titans making small movements when they have no crew aboard and are essentially just stationary. They're sleeping. Princeps as well have described how some Titans, when in transport between worlds, can feel trapped and frustrated by being held in such claustrophobic spaces as a starship, and that their Titans long to be free on the open surface of a planet. This highly challenging machine spirit is why it's so critical to find individuals who are capable of becoming a princeps, and why such a rare few individuals are capable of merging their mind with the machine spirit of a titan. Yet it's this spirit that is precisely why titans are so powerful. They can react and move and engage enemy just by thinking. The princeps and the machine become one and the same, and there's little if anything that compares to the technological achievement of a titan. Yet as we learn from the Castigator Titan, these Titans of humanity are but pale imitations of what had come before during the Dark Age, which sounds fairly familiar, encountering AI from the Dark Age does always seem to come with a fair amount of salt. But on top of all this comes the issue of Reaver Titans. Now, Reaver Titans have sat between the lighter grade Warhound and the more standard Warlord for millennia, but the Reaver has become ever less common. Now there could be reasons for this that are as simple as reavers not being built anymore as resources are seen to be more appropriately designated to classes like the Warhound and the Warlord. However, it is also rumoured that the reaver is not being built as frequently because the Mechanicus have lost the knowledge of how to do so. If this turned out to be the case, it would fairly put the nail in the coffin in terms of the argument that Titans are able to be built without any kind of STC. As I say, it strikes me as something of a contradiction, that the Mechanicus are meant to be able to build these vast war machines, essentially from shared memory, yet incapable of building far more straightforward things without an STC. Now additionally, when it comes to a larger Titan known as an Emperor Titan, this is believed to have been lost knowledge now, they can't build more Emperor class Titans. And that really kills this whole idea for me. Because if you at one time knew how to build something like the Emperor Titan, and you still have them around, it would make sense, would it not, that you could look at the other Titans you have and work out that difference. I mean, there has to be some level of shared, understood knowledge here within the Mechanicus, and I struggle to believe that that could somehow just be extinguished if you are passing knowledge down through. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Whereas, if that information was stored on an STC, and then you lost that STC blueprint, that's when you don't know how to make that thing anymore. And this is what happens to the Mechanicus. They will know how to build a certain machine, a certain piece of hardware, and then the STC is destroyed, or corroded, or corrupted, or whatever, and they then can't produce that thing anymore, because they never bothered to learn how to make it, they just use the STC. So when suddenly they can't build Titans, it seems far more feasible to me that that's the answer not that they just forgot how to make it. 
So in conclusion, bringing all of this together, the fact that we have multiple pieces of evidence that STC elements exist for Titans, which for me should just end the discussion there and then, coupled with their immense complexity and their generally stunted, fragmented and oft incapable level of technology humanity finds itself trapped within, it leads to a fairly vague but less open conclusion than one might have expected. It seems simply entirely improbable that Titans are constructed without any STC knowledge. It is believable and established that the Mechanicus have used their own initiative and constructed machines based on existing knowledge. Because remember, the cult of the machine does not truly invent as we would understand it, doesn't really truly research in the strictest sense either. But it can explore and use existing knowledge to bring elements of things together so as to create new patterns, new versions of existing things. And that is of course a thin line of acceptability within the boundaries established by its leadership and has to be trodden very carefully by the more peripheral tech priests, those with beliefs outside the norm, looking at you, Belisarius Call. All in all, with regard to the origins of Imperial Titans, they certainly did emerge during the early days of the Mechanicus towards the end of the Age of Strife, that's fine. Yet so it also is with much of 40k, the detailed specifics are very sparse and may never be fully known. And for me, anybody who might claim otherwise with heel dug in certainty is merely engaging in self-deluded speculation, especially with the accounted evidence that points us to the specifics that run counter to the common narrative. I guess my final compromise would be that perhaps they know with STC how to make specific components, pieces of the machines, and they use those to kind of combine them together. So it's kind of six of one and half a dozen of another. To be fair, if you wanted to come down in the middle, that's probably where you're gonna land. The Emperor of Man understood all too well the power of the Mechanicum, later to be titled the Mechanicus. As did they similarly recognize his power and technical genius. So it was that together they would come to an agreement where the forces of Mars would once again cooperate in alliance with its neighbours from Terra. But they would retain a strong degree of independence, while in return they would support and loan their hardware to the newly founded Imperium. Thus humanity entered this new age and its forces collectively would have access to some of the most powerful war machines ever created. More often than not, the simple presence of such world-ending god machines, which were quite capable of destroying entire cities, the Titans during the glory days of the Imperium could be deployed hundreds at a time. The mission was to unite humanity by any means necessary and purge any who resisted. Usually though, this was often attempted to do so with as little damage as possible to those who they wanted to bring under the banner of a united humanity. And the Titans were a convenient visual way to present a show of force that could not be questioned. And this certainly played a large part in preventing bloody counterproductive wars and aided along with the obviously Astartes legions to speed up the crusade. Titans could be for those problem worlds a very literal way of saying, look, don't even try it, just surrender now or else, which worked most of the time. And this would all come to an end during the period of the crusade of course, known as the heresy, when eventually it became clear that the schism was far wider than just among the Astartes, that the rot of chaos had infected even the Mechanicum, which was now fighting its own internal struggle. And this eventually would lead to engagements of appalling scale and destruction as battles of, quite literally, titanic proportions would occur with ever increasing regularity. Now originally the Titan legions were known as orders, as in an order being a small group, not a literal directive. But as their numbers continued to grow, they would be reorganised at the behest of the fabricator general as a wholly new division of the Mechanicum to oversee the Titans, and it is known as the Collegia Titanica. This would bring together the orders into Titanic legions. They will operate with generally a common heritage and fighting style. Some are more disciplined or cautious than others, some more reckless and aggressive. Depending on the disciplines of each legion, it will dictate how they are utilised and obviously how suitable they are for specific operations. Some will play a role as heavy scouting operations on very dangerous worlds, others used in more stationary fortification and defence. Most often they'll be used for heavy siege battles to break and annihilate entrenched enemy positions. 
While singular titans will still define any battle, they are more usually organised into their titan legions, the legio, and these will be stationed on Mechanicus forge worlds as standard and remain under the control of the Mechanicus, not the Astartes or the Imperial Guard. Technically, Inquisition can request titans be at their disposal, but most Inquisitors, if they have any sense at all, will be somewhat tactful about dealing too bluntly or too abrasively with the Mechanicus, who are unsurprisingly protective of their titans who they worship as god machines of the Omnisire, and so they do not appreciate being forcibly dictated to as to their deployment. This is one of the curious details in the relationship between the Mechanicus and the Imperium. While together they technically both constitute what is the Imperium, the Mechanicus theoretically operates under that banner, but has fairly sweeping discretion when it comes to choosing how it will commit its resources in aiding Imperial forces and the Titan Legions are a prime example. In fact, many Mechanicus are off in the galaxy, doing their own things completely out of the order of the Imperium itself, as they explore for more STC fragments and lost technology. Now, much as it was with the Emperor himself, their control of these vast war machines, and moreover, their relative understanding of technology, is what gives the Mechanicus such power and influence within the Imperium and the wider galaxy. You can easily imagine how, say, the Ecclesiarchy would desire to have a Titan Legion of their own, so as to be able to dress it up with all the prophetic symbolism that they so rampantly propagate. Indeed, for many humans across the galaxy, to merely lay eyes upon a god machine of war, such as a titan, would leave them on their knees, absolutely overwhelmed by the sight. So it's not difficult to see how this would suit the ecclesiarchy perfectly for their agenda. Instead, though, they're left to dream of such things, for they hold no power or real authority over the Mechanicus. We're unlikely to ever see such a thing, as an Ecclesiarchy Legio. But Knights, on the other hand, are a different matter, as they are mainly semi-independent, some having a loyalty to the Mechanicus, others to the Imperium, some are basically Ronin, known as Freeblades, and you could certainly have a noble house who become the zealots of the Ecclesiarchy. The Collegia Titanica is primarily split into four divisions, which can operate independently or cooperatively. The first is the Divisio Mandati, and they're responsible for the oversight of the Collegia, and are also known as an Executive Order of Titans. They'll be deployed using vast battleship-sized temple spacecraft, and are responsible for bringing the Pax Imperia to independent or isolated Imperial worlds. Each temple ship carries between two and five of the immense Emperor Titans, accompanied by attending tech priests, troops, maintenance and support. Now, each Emperor Titan itself is so massive that it will contain units from the Adeptus Arbites, Inquisition and Adeptus Terra, and it is their role to bring the Pax Imperia to any and all worlds in their care. The Emperor Titans serve them as an operational platform and is a powerfully persuasive tool to establish or restore order and enforcement of the Imperial will. Few worlds on seeing an Emperor Titan would dare to stand in opposition to such force. They are, after all, the biggest Titans that exist in the Imperium, and also forcible implementation of their rule is the way of the Imperium since day one. The options most often given to humanity's citizens are usually fall in line or be destroyed. The Mandati will also carry a sub-order known as Missionary Orders, which will actually travel beyond the boundaries of the Imperium and even known space, with the rogue traders in tow to bring planets into the fold of the Imperium. The second Divisio is the Telepathica, and this is a smaller division than the others due to its specialised nature, and as a result of the massive power and importance of the Collegia, they have their own dedicated Psyker division. While heavily shrouded from general knowledge, they operate what are known as Psy Titans, and this is something that the Collegia would never openly admit to owning. They are to one degree or another essentially the Grey Knights of Titans. And much like the Greys, these are believed to operate from a secretive forge world of unknown location near to the heart of the Imperium. Very little information exists regarding the details of this division due to its highly secretive nature, but one can only imagine if the power of the Grey Knights are scaled up to the size of Titans, they will certainly have high importance in the coming millennia for the Imperium as chaos becomes ever more invasive into the galaxy. Third is the Divisio Investigatus, who occupy a strangely contradicting role for the Mechanicus as a scientific research and development division of the Collegia Titanica. So let's just put a pin in that for now. The Investigatus are based on Mars and are occupied with the repair, replacement, research and building of new Titans and their logistics, as well as field testing of new designs. 
They've also essentially a school for training everyone in the Collegia with a focus on improvements in technology. While they're primarily based on Mars, they will sometimes travel to test things in active battle, or for example to train forge worlds in new construction methods for Titans. Which as we discussed earlier, is a thing, but it's definitely open to scrutiny just how fully independent that construction knowledge actually is. However, it is undoubtedly passed along in part through a process of educating and teaching new Mechanicus engineers. Now when we come back to that research and development point, it makes little sense on the face of it. However, I would suggest that you kind of read between the lines here, and that when they say research and development for the Mechanicus, what that means is looking at the things that exist and working out, hey, can we kind of do anything better with this? Can we restructure it? Can we kind of place these different positions? How can we perhaps just boost and improve things slightly more than brand new technology? Lastly, we have the Divisio Militaris. And this is the most straightforward of the divisions, as its name suggests. It represents the military orders of the Titan legions. Each legio will have its own dedicated forge world or worlds, and while these forge worlds are their official base of operations, the legions will be in reality stationed throughout the galaxy in a state of usually permanent transportation. Many journeys take so long that they may be redirected before they even are able to return home, only doing so for essential maintenance and upgrading. The Militaris role lies primarily in guarding vulnerable locations across the Imperium or supporting frontline forces to prevent further loss of territory. One important detail with the Militaris is that no order is allowed to have its own personal transportation. This is a critical detail that is often omitted when people are talking about the orders or the legios and it obviously has very significant implications. It is Imperial policy that the transportation of Titans only be provided by the Imperial Navy or the Imperial Fleet. And the obvious reasoning for this is that during the Heresy, more than half of the Mechanicum's legions joined the traitors. And they were able to do this as they had access to their own transports, which meant a devastating loss of military hardware to the Imperium. So as things stand now, the Orders and Legions are reliant on others for their transportation, and this diminishes their independence and the ability to deploy or relocate without official authority to do so. This very bureaucratic approach undoubtedly slows down the Legions and creates administrative issues, but it's seen as a necessary evil to prevent any repetition of historical events. And one has to question why this same approach has not been similarly implemented for, say, the Astartes, even though they have been broken down now into chapters. In fact, you could imagine that a specific logistical division of the Inquisition could have been established for this exact reason. But anyway, that's a tangent that I can cover another time. Many of the Orders and Legio can trace their personal histories right back to the founding of the Imperium. They're used in a huge variety of roles, as I've already described, but essentially, they are the heaviest force that can be deployed by the Imperium, whether that be for defensive or offensive purposes. Often within the Imperium, the term sledgehammer is used to describe the amount of force utilized by the Imperium. Well, if the more standard forces for the Imperium are a sledgehammer, then the Titans are undoubtedly a wrecking ball. The one weakness for the Titan Legions is, of course, their deployment. It's not logistically easy to move around giant gods of war, and so they're not so readily able to deploy rapidly as might say Astartes or other Imperial forces. However, of course, what they lack in rapid strike, they make up for with frankly obscene levels of firepower and survivability. Once they're able to be deployed, very little is going to reasonably stand against them, other than a comparable force of enemy or Xenos Titans. When it comes to the numbers, talking about Titan legions conjures up images of legions being similar to those of the Astartes in the early days of the Imperium. So how many Titans are we talking about in a legion here? Hundreds of thousands of Titans within a legion? We know that the Imperium fights battles on a truly apocalyptic scale. Hive cities will wield tens of millions of fighters and Imperial Guard forces, but there is a strong difference between these kind of Imperial infantry forces and the Titan legions. Even the largest Titan legions will only be able to field something like two to three hundred Titans. Now I say only, it is of course no small number to be able to deploy that many Titans. In fact, deploying 200 Titans to world is basically game over for those in opposition, and potentially the planet itself for that matter. Now as I already discussed, large numbers are not only not easily possible, but that size of force is often not necessary in order to act as a deterrent. The idea of facing off against even one titan is usually enough to give many enemies of mankind pause for thought. 
although obviously many Xenos do have their own comparable iterations on Titans. So far more important than the sheer numbers for the Legion are the types of Titan class available to them. And this will also, as mentioned before, be somewhat dictated to by their individual history, their tactical approach to battles, preferred weapon loadouts, and so on. Many Legion's bulk can consist of these smaller and lighter grade Warhound Titans, which while still very powerful, are more akin to a large Castigator Knight than a true Titan. The most common other class though, is the massive Warlord Titans, which constitute the bulk of most Legion's force. In between these two are the older design of Reaver Titans, which while still impressive and powerful, lack the mobility of the Warhound and cannot wield as much firepower as a Warlord. But still, they are far from irrelevant, and they are more than capable of bringing world-ending levels of destruction to any theatre of war. And then there was the more uncommon due to its sheer size, Emperor class. Now these are not the only class of Titans that exist, but those four are the main bulk. Others can include the Warbringer Nemesis, the Night Gaunt, the Apocalypse, Carnivore and Komodo, but these are fairly unique constructions. Depending on how it's set up, legions would usually play to their strengths as dictated by their bulk class and quantity of titans available. Even if a legion did have anything like 100 titans available, it would be uncommon to see this number actually be deployed. The logistics alone of doing so would be far from a straightforward operation for very obvious reasons. So to give a general idea of operational scale, it's far more common to see Titans be deployed in single figures up to as many as 10. But equally, they could be seen deployed singularly so long as they had sufficient supporting force to help in defending them. Unsurprisingly, it comes down to an average of between 2 and 5 Titans per campaign or engagement. In the modern age of the Imperium, it would have to be a significantly heavy engagement to require more support than this. Because as powerful as Titans are in terms of firepower and shielding, they are not without their weaknesses, and unless a battle is entirely one-sided, the supporting force will be necessary, and that force will have to be able to appropriately scale to accommodate defending Titans. Throughout the Heresy, the Mechanicus Titan Legions were as divided as any other faction within the Imperium and would fight across the worlds of mankind, often at critical battles such as Moloch and the Beta Garmin Cluster. But perhaps none more so than in the final days of the Heresy, as the Legio Mortis would be the Chaos Titan Legion who breached the walls of the Imperial Palace on Terra, thereby allowing Chaos forces to pour inside. Eventually, of course, both the Traitor Titans and Astartes Legions, along with the remnants of the Mechanicum, will be pushed back into the Eye of Terror, where they largely remain even despite the cataclysmic events of the late 41st millennium. In fact, the Dark Mechanicum have been disturbingly quiet since the Heresy, and we know they retreated there with many Titans. While a great many forces of the Imperium would see significant restructuring after the Heresy, this was not the case for the Titan Legions beyond their aforementioned transportation restrictions. There was little need to change the way that they operated or were structured beyond this, as their reasons for splitting from the Imperium were not related to their operational structure, and so those Loyalist Legions and their Forge Worlds remained much as they did during their initial designation. Legions, much like any other division of Imperial forces, will have their own armour design, their own iconography and heraldry, as well as usually having its own title, like say, Legio Invicta or Legio Ataris. This can then be distilled down to a simple description based on their preferred armaments or tactics. So commonly you'll see titles with fire, fire brands or the fire kings, as well as any number featuring death, emperor, etc. Now a small forward for this section, I'll list some general heights for the Titans, but this is one of the most poorly stated pieces of data when it comes to lore continuity. From novel to novel, Titans of the same class can go from being 40 odd meters to over 100. It's just one of those things which is badly established within the lore itself and honestly should really be pinned down much more tightly by now. So I'm using measurements based off of the current Forge World models, which seems the most reasonable. So that's my small FYI disclaimer, short version, Titans are really big. But as impressive as Titans are to see and bear witness to such gods of war, they are also ancient. And while the Imperium relies on a lot of old tech, most of this has been rebuilt and refashioned over time. 
Many of its starships, for example, have been stripped and upgraded, its military hardware produced from forge worlds, and while some armour may have been around since the dawn of the Imperium, like for example Terminator armour or Dreadnought, a great deal of Space Marine armour, if not most of it at this point, and other hardware for the Imperium can be and is produced as new. Titans, however, are old machines. Most of them have been around for many thousands of years, some even as long as 10,000 or older. Because they're based on ancient designs that have not been altered, they therefore still use these old plasma reactors to power them. And this enables them to use void shield technology, something that's usually only seen on fortified defense networks and starships. No ground unit other than Titans has anything more powerful than a void shield. These ancient designs, again, developed in the dark age of technology, use warp technology similar to a power field but void shields are able to be raised again very quickly after taking enough damage to make them collapse. Much like starships, titans use void shields by layering multiple shield layers so that if one fails, another will prevent it taking damage until that one which was collapsed can be raised again. This will enable the titan to remain almost invincible and immune to all incoming fire. Each shield will absorb damage until it is overloaded, upon which its safety features will cut in and force the generator to shut down, bleeding off excess energy before it's restarted again and made operable. One weakness though that comes from void shielding on titans is that the bubble around the titan extends usually about 30 meters from the titan itself. This varies less on say a warhound, but it means that for larger titans, infantry and enemy vehicles should be able to penetrate its shield and then deal direct damage unhindered. This of course does rely on them being able to actually approach this close in the first place, but in theory it's possible. This is why titans will usually be accompanied by ground forces as security to mitigate this risk. For the crew, managing a titan's void shields and its power systems is a constant balancing act. In some rare situations, a titan princeps may even choose to deliberately overload their void shields, bypassing its safety features to avoid incoming fire that they know will surely penetrate and deal heavy damage to them. And this is a very high risk gamble, but this is the game titan commanders play. But just beyond that, Balancing power systems is actually a core focus for the Moderati and the Princeps team. Ordinarily, they will only draw as much power from the plasma core as is necessary, but in extreme or just tactically appropriate situations, a Princeps will divert power from one area to another, trading one positive gain for loss elsewhere. One of the most dangerous methods of this is to transfer energy from the monumentally power-hungry void shields, reducing the Titan's defenses to further overcharge its attacks. In the midst of heavy battle, this power transfer ballet can become a fluid and skillful dance of death, pushing and pulling power from systems as incoming fires hitting the shielding, redistributing it into weapons to return the most devastating fire possible. So titans may appear to be kind of static walking machines that just are shooting at the enemy, but in actual fact there's a lot going on within them as they walk across a battlefield. Pushing a titan's reactor is not without risk, and this constant gambling can inevitably lead to dire consequences should their void shields burn out, or worse, a catastrophic containment failure of its reactor. Such events can lead to anything from just damage to that reactor's housing, or a more dangerous plasma leak, or even a worst case scenario, a full-on reactor meltdown, the center of the titan boiling out with molten plasma as its void shields fail and the entire construction collapses in a huge explosion, likely consuming any friendly forces in close proximity as well. So let's now talk about the titan classes. Now first, the comically titled Scout Titans, and unlike the Bane Blade, the scout role for the Warhounds is actually a real thing. This is because obviously what you want for scouting missions is a lumbering 15 meter or 45 foot war machine charging over terrain. Stealth is certainly not the goal here. Moreover, the terminology of scout is more down to relaying information from the front line to the larger titans behind them to help in directing and positioning them to approaching threats. Deploying large machines of war is not easy and they will need time to position themselves as most titans are only capable of firing from the front in what's called a corridor. They have a very narrow arc to fire from and something as massive as a warlord titan is not going to turn around quickly. So scout titans fulfill a role in aiding tactical planning. The physical design and appearance of a scout titan may be something of an homage to their machine spirits which as I mentioned earlier seem to be something of a blend of animal spirit 
to imbue their nature with a naturally aggressive and sentient, but not fully self-aware in the same way as a human conscious mind. But it could also be to just make them look more intimidating, as if that needed to be the case. Comparative to other titans, the Warhound are only lightly armed in their scout class, but saying lightly armed is fairly comical considering they will regularly wield any combination of Vulcan Mega Bolters, Inferno Cannon, Turbo Laser and Plasma Blast Guns, all of which are just horrifically devastating weapons. This coupled with their faster, more manoeuvrable design actually makes them in many ways far more of a terrifying prospect than a singular larger titan. In fact, if a legion consisted mainly of warhounds, this should be by no means underestimated. They're not a lighter contingent, they can still deliver a truly terrifying amount of firepower to a battlefield. Warhounds can excel at ambushing their enemy and play a far more seek and destroy role than other titans. They can also go from an idle engine to full speed sprint in 20 seconds or less. However, due to their size, they are only protected by two void shield generators. Now, as described, titans do rely on multiple void shields to ensure their safety against other titans and sustained heavy fire, so this does make the Warhound more vulnerable. But with that in mind, it means that they may choose to engage with an enemy more aggressively for this very reason, relying on their void shields to initially give them an edge before pinning down their enemy with obscene levels of firepower, and sometimes even leaping out point-blank range and literally pinning them into the ground with withering fire from its Vulcan Mega Bolter or incinerating them in Plasma or Prometheum. A crew of just four make up the operators of a Warhound, one Princeps, two Moderati to assist in the cockpit, and a Tech Priest behind them in the engine section. Warhounds will usually operate in pairs because of their relative size, but even larger single Titans will always have a supporting force to assist them. The reason Warhounds are often seen to operate in pairs is because they're far more mobile and operate ahead or on the front lines, so they will not necessarily have the supporting ground forces to protect them as would larger Reaver and Warlord Titans. So while larger Titans can technically operate singularly, it's not strictly accurate to say this. Titans can be vulnerable and it wouldn't be smart to deploy a large single Titan to a battlefield without appropriate supporting forces. There are three subclass of Warhound Titan, the Wolf, Mastiff and Jackal. These all have small mechanical loadout differentiations to suit their battlefield role, there's no major differences. So Warhound Titans on the face of things can seem small in the context of other Titans, perhaps even underwhelming, but they are in fact neither. They're aggressive shock units that can launch lightning fast raids on enemy, shattering them and slaughtering powerful enemy units before they then sprint out of harm's way to regroup. There's certainly nothing underwhelming about a Warhound Titan, especially when you consider that two have spent many thousands of years stationed outside the Eternity Gate on Terra. This is the final entrance to the Emperor of Man's inner sanctum, and such a hallowed honour is not granted lightly and should be considered with fair caution. Reaver Titans sit between the Warhound and Warlord, but it's not really correct to call them medium scale. This is technically true, but it's not by design. They were never set out to be graded as a medium scale, it's just ended up that way. Their lesser size than the Warlord is simply due to their evolving developmental process of creating the Titans, and this is why the Reavers are not as massive as a Warlord in basically all respects. Yet their size is unquestionably imposing. A Reaver stands at some 26 meters or 85 feet tall and will visually dominate any battlefield it stands upon. The Reaver carries twice as much void shielding as a Warhound and considerably more physical armour. Reavers have probably only survived as long as they have as a class of Titan, in part due to the location of their power source. Within a Warlord, this power core is centrally located in the Titan, but for a Reaver, this sits at the rear of the Titan, much like a Castigator Knight, and as a result, a Reaver Titan can take far more damage to its front, which is generally where most damage is going to be coming at a Titan. Most Titans will always be careful to ensure that their front is facing their enemy because that's where they'll be shooting at. And they have the same crew complement as a Warhound, which considering they're twice the size, is an amazing achievement to only be crewed by four people. The Tech Priest of a Reaver though may have several servitors to assist, which a Warhound would usually not, mainly for reasons of space. The major upgrade for a Reaver is its ability to use what might be termed close quarter weapons. Again, this concept on a Titan scale is fairly bonkers, 
but it is what it is. They're able to use power fists on either or even both arms, and they also carry a ferocious arsenal of weapons from a Gatling or laser blaster, volcano or melter cannon. Most importantly, they can also mount an apocalypse missile launcher carrying 24 rounds to lay down significant ordnance against ranged targets. And this carapace can also mount vortex missiles, plasma blast gun, a turbo laser destructor, inferno gun, Vulcan megabolter, and warp missiles. There are three subclass of Reaver, the Vandal, Hun, and Goth, and again, these are variations on configuration, don't significantly alter the appearance or operation of a Reaver. The Vandal and Goth are just loadouts for faster assault missions or heavy long-range engagements respectively. Warlord Titans are the most common unit for Titan Legions and will stand just over 100 feet or over 30 meters tall. They're roughly 25% taller than a Reaver Titan. But the nature of Titans in general is not fully standardized, so this may not be universally accurate for the Warlord or indeed any Titan. Now a Warlord is obviously more powerful than its former classes, and so it's capable of sustaining an impressive six Void Shields. This means that anything other than sustained fire from an entire enemy army or multiple enemy Titans will be capable of bringing down its array of Void Shielding. Should this occur, a Warlord can potentially be more vulnerable than a Reaver because although it still has heavy physical armor, because of its centrally located core, its power systems are in theory more vulnerable than a Reaver, which has its power located at the rear as we said. Now obviously this also presents a danger for Reaver Titans that should they be attacked anyway with heavy fire from the rear, this can lead to their demise in very short order. So it's a small but notable difference in the configuration of Titan design. Another small but worthy difference is the crew of a Warlord Titan's cockpit is split across two levels. It will have its princeps accompanied by an unspecific number of moderati, but potentially as many as four. Its tech priest will also have multiple servers plugged in as slave units to the weapon systems. They'll also have aboard an engine seer. These are basically mystical members of the cult Mechanicus who will imbue rituals and litanies on the machines yet they carry also a wealth of practical, more basic technical knowledge. Although, strangely, while they're very well regarded by standard Imperial citizens, they're not especially highly regarded among the Mechanicus itself, who see them as fairly lowly and just a cog in the machine as it were. The extra moderati in a Warlord are necessary not only for its size, but as the Princeps is required to be focused on keeping the powerful machine spirit under control, in fact the Princeps of a Warlord, where other Titans may suffice with a manifold plug-in similar to a Knight's Throne Mechanicum, within a Warlord they may use this system, but this is often seen as being dated and now, instead of Princeps may be fully integrated into a Warlord Titan by means of either a full spinal integration connection, leaving them permanently interred within the throne of the Titan, or they may be similarly to Imperial Navigators immersed in an amniotic fluid tank, both enabling them to maintain more permanent assembly with the Titan's spirit, forging a stronger, more intrinsic bond that allows them the cognitive strength to pilot such a war machine whilst minimizing the risks of being outside that Titan, the mental stress of not remaining connected with it. But all of these come with pros and cons that I'll explain shortly. There are two most common pattern of Warlord Titan, both of which appear visually very different. The Mars Alpha pattern Warlord bears more resemblance to the Reaver Titan, it's just 25% bigger. The second is known as the Lucius Alpha pattern Warlord Titan and has far more closed plating. Its shoulder and top mounting section look vaguely similar to an Emperor Titan, but without all the embellishment. And there are three other main patterns, the Mars Beta, Proximus and Sinister Psy. The Warlord class also has four subclasses, the Eclipse, Deathbringer, Nightgaunt and the Nemesis. As with the other Titan classes, the Warlord wields basically the same weapons as the Reaver, with the addition of an Arioch Power Claw. Its most notable upgrade comes in the form of being able to wield two carapace mounts to the Reaver's one. In many ways there's a little difference between the Warlord and Reaver considering their size, the most significant distinction is the power core location and the fact that the Warlord deploys two extra Void Shields, which is no small thing and can make all the difference between survival and destruction. Finally, we come to the rarely seen Emperor class of Titans. Few legions will wield an Emperor, and if they do, you could count how many on one hand. They are less war machines than walking planetary fortresses. They have Void Shields, of course, this is the standard for Titans, but Emperors have 12 Void Shields. 
but even so with armour as thick as the Emperor, very little is going to threaten you anyway. The most notable difference between the Emperor and other Titans is their appearance. They're basically walking cathedrals. They feature spires or ornate work they feature spires and ornate work that wouldn't look out of place on an ecclesiarchy church, which no doubt delights the Ministorum whenever they can use such visuals to their advantage. There are only two variations of Emperor Titan, the Imperator and the Warmonger. The difference is really only their armaments. The Warmonger has more advanced targeting systems and is designed around fire support. The Imperator is more general purpose. Another noticeable feature is that an Emperor is indeed so massive that it can actually carry regiments of infantry and even Astartes on board, usually in its lower leg plates, which are themselves like bastions. It is absolutely one of the best features of the Emperor that infantry will come flooding out when threatened by enemy forces who may seek to evade its void shielding and deal direct damage to its lower levels, so those stationed on board stand ready to repel borders and protect the massive titan at all costs. Sadly, as I said earlier, these massive gods of war can no longer be manufactured by the Mechanicus, to which I yet again state my objections to the nature of titan construction. They're so good at remembering how to make these things, who's forgetting this process? Why is it not written down somewhere? Anyway, it's hard to pinpoint the size of an emperor as no 40k model exists to represent it. However, judging by records and other games of the past, it's very likely coming in somewhere around 45 to 55 meters, something like 140 to 180 feet tall. It's a big thing. It could easily be more though, depending on what kind of carapace setup it's carrying. Its crew is still going to be primarily one experienced princeps, but a whole team of moderati and tech priests who are going to aid them in the micromanagement of such a powerful entity. The Mechanicus will be especially vigilant as they believe the Emperor Titans to be a literal avatar of the Omnissiah. And as for the weapons for an Emperor Titan, well, they are significant. Its carapace can carry as many as six mounted secondary weapons, ranging from all the aforementioned standard Titan armaments. The Warmonger class Titan carries a heavy Doomstrike missile launcher, Vengeance cannon, and a battery of auto cannon. For the Imperator, its two standard arm mounted weapons are a Hellstorm cannon and Plasma Annihilator. The Hellstorm cannon is a giant multi barreled energy weapon that can strip away all void shielding from a wall or Titan in a single volley. The Plasma Annihilator though does what it says on the tin. It's a larger version of the Sun Fury Plasma weapon that is used on Warlords, basically a really big plasma gun that can lay down heavy or rapid fire bursts by using the plasma reactors of the Titan to fire devastating levels of charge. In fact, it's difficult to describe just how powerful a weapon this is. It's essentially like firing small stars at your enemy. Yes, stars as in the sun in space. Imagine a small version of that being fired by a gigantic gun. That's basically what this weapon is. Obviously that spells bad news for those who are being fired at and it's likely bad news for those Imperial Guard fighting below it as it passes overhead. The immense heat likely is going to strip skin off their bodies, incinerating those directly below its path and the roar of firing a gun like this would deafen those within its vicinity. It's a destructive weapon that's almost as dangerous to its own side as to those on the ground, and any infantry even coming close to where this giant star ball of energy lands are going to be vaporised or worse. Enemy titans will be turned into a mixture of glass and molten remains. As I alluded to earlier, the deployment of titans to a world can be hazardous to the world itself, not just to those they seek to obliterate. The power of an Emperor Titan is so vast that rounds from something like a Plasma Annihilator landing in the wrong place could potentially trigger any number of geological events, and who knows what kind of damage multiple Imperators all firing in the same place could deal. In many ways, the Emperor class of Titan is so world-ending, it's not perhaps the worst thing that they're no longer able to be constructed by the Mechanicus. But it is, however, a potent reminder of how powerful humanity once was, and where it has fallen to now. Even its most powerful assets, such as the Warlord Titan, really pale into insignificance compared to an Emperor Titan. And yet now, they can't even build these things anymore. It's an ever downward spiral. There are few individuals in the Imperium who are classed as being indispensable 
In fact, the Imperium usually operates from the opposite perspective, as we well know. Victory by any means necessary, even if that means running the enemy out of ammunition through sheer weight of numbers. However, similarly to the Navigators, the Princeps are one of the most individually valuable assets for the Imperium. A Princeps can be recruited from anywhere, but the vetting process is stringent. Not necessarily a harrowing trial by pain as per Astartes, but tough nonetheless. The reasoning for this is primarily because merging a mind with a titan's machine spirit is no small thing, and only the strongest mental willpower will be able to resist suffering catastrophic brain damage or being consumed by the machine spirit of the titan itself. It is said that only 1 in 10 million individuals will meet the requirements to enter training as a princeps. How true those numbers really are is difficult to say, but it is certain that they are very rare individuals. Thankfully, unlike Astartes and Grey Knights, they don't actually have to kill that many people. To find a Princeps, they can just go and test people. But because of this rarity, should a Titan fall in battle and become immobilized, the Imperium will do almost anything to recover it and that Princeps from the battlefield. The loss of a Titan is a devastating thing to be sure, but by and large they can always build a new. Princeps, on the other hand, how readily they can be found and ready to enter action is a much more difficult question. As I mentioned earlier, a Princeps will control a Titan through its manifold. This either takes the form of a hard plug equivalent of what is referred to as the New Sphere, which you'll remember maybe was used by Kuriel Zeth on Mars. It's a system likely, as with everything originating from humanity's golden age, and is used to remotely access information to the mind. Given what we know from this system and our evidence of the golden age of artificial intelligence, that have almost always seemed to have this ability to remotely and wirelessly access systems and data, I would speculate that during the golden age, humanity had developed technology that allowed them to implant devices into their brain or cerebral cortex and thereby allow them to merge with their advanced AI so as to be able to pilot vessels and become one with their ships. If this were true, and bear in mind this is my head cannon speculation here, but I think if it were true, it would very easily explain why, say, AI vessels encountered by Astartes, whose captain was murdered by the Imperium, was so heavily traumatized by this. Also, we know they have such capability to control systems with a mere thought. And so this is why Princeps used this hard plug-in equivalent to access the Titan's machine spirit through mind impulse units. A Titan's manifold is a space detached from reality that Princeps and to a lesser degree the Moderati crew use to engage with and command their war engine as a means to realize their surrounding environment. For the Princeps, this is how they merge and become one with the Titan's machine spirit. Princeps tryouts will be selected based on two characteristics initially, intelligence and strength of mind. The Collegia would dispatch teams of tech priests on scouting missions to find those suitable for the selection process and test them extensively, especially for any genetic deviations, but also to fulfill the basic criteria. If they like what they find, they'll return them to Mars for training to begin. When finally selected, a Princeps training at the Collegia Titanica will be focused on three core aspects. One, remaining mobile. Two, piloting and simultaneously commanding its crew and third, of course, how best and most efficiently to kill the enemy. Now, unlike a starty selection, while a few will rise to the ranks of a princeps, the others will not make the grade. But instead of being left to clean up the halls and polish things, or just shot in the head, as is the Astartes way most often, a princeps tryout who is less successful can fall back on the still critical role of becoming a moderati. They are in charge, after all, of aiding the Princeps and management of the Titan's weapon systems, navigation and control systems. And if the tryouts don't even live up to that, well, they can still join the Skitari or other Mechanicus forces. But training to become a Princeps is no small thing. Surprisingly, it will take many years of study, unblemished records in training simulation, mental and physical exercises, and years of detailed indoctrination into the cult Mechanicus. Only when they have proven beyond all doubt that they're not only capable of handling the merging process with a machine spirit, but also have demonstrated an inhuman machine-like level of reliability, will a princeps be qualified as a titan princeps. But they then still may have to wait many years, having made it onto a legion's roster, and will await a new titan becoming available for them for whatever reason. But the machine spirits of titans, as we have noted, are considerably more powerful than they are for, say, their lesser knight counterparts. And as such, the initial binding process with a princeps will be the most dangerous time, as they essentially must break the spirit 
or the will of the machine and become the dominant mental entity in the partnership. If successful, many princeps will be linked with their titan for life. For some, this means literally being interred as part of the machine. For the princeps, the machine and they are now one and the same. They can sense the outside world around them, much like we can sense air moving over our skin or heat or rain. They will have what you would describe as a peripheral sense, but far beyond what we can sense as mere mortal humans. The powerful sensory systems of the Titan will feed all the information of the exterior back into the princeps, enabling them with a high degree of awareness and sensory control. For a princeps, moving and fighting will feel very much like they themselves are moving and fighting on the battlefield. It's a concept of an experience that for many is truly difficult to visualize. The power of becoming a Titan in this way can in fact be dangerous some princeps can become addicted to battle and the feeling of basically becoming an invincible war machine raining down apocalyptic destruction on the enemies of man. It's a huge rush and sense of power and some find it very difficult to control the urge to want to destroy. For those princeps that are not interred permanently, they can similarly feel very addicted to being connected with their titan for this same reason, this huge feeling of invincible superiority. And once having tasted that power, if they're deprived of it for extended periods, it can actually lead them into a descent into madness. Now, some princeps may opt to be placed in an amniotic fluid tank to enable them a better interface with their Titan. And while this has advantages in pairing more deeply with the machine spirit and having deeper control, the princeps also runs the risk of becoming more and more part of the machine itself. Their body will inevitably wither over time and eventually they may become almost like a ghost in the machine spirit itself rather than a physical being. Now for some this will not necessarily matter in terms of the titan's operation, but it can lead to the princeps losing perspective on their own humanity and their relationship to those with who they serve. In some cases this can even lead to a princeps losing sight of their place in the bigger picture and they can become entirely detached from reality. For them, they are the machine. They are this godlike machine, and not dissimilarly to the few examples of advanced AI encountered by the Imperium, this sort of disconnection from the trials and troubles of humanity can lead to a deep apathy for mankind. Such a situation can also occur if a Titan is damaged and its princeps dies while connected to the machine spirit. This can have the effect of the princeps spirit essentially entering into that of the Titan and becoming a part of it, again like a ghost within the machine of the Titan. This does not mean it will necessarily be able to pilot it, but it will be a presence that then remains with the Titan and could be a positive or negative influence for any new princeps who pairs with the Titan. Generally speaking, all of these kind of dangers are obviously not good for the princeps, the Titan or the Mechanicus. And this is why the mental training is so vigorous before a Titan is assigned to a princeps. Now take note, I will talk about the events of Beta Garmin and Titan death. Anybody wanting to avoid spoilers, skip ahead to the timestamp on screen. The Beta Garmin star cluster balances on the edge of the Segmentum Solar. Half a dozen star systems closely linked by stable warp routes and heavily fortified by the Imperium. Unbeknownst to its citizens, the star cluster would become the site of Titan battles that would forever scar it, for it held a critical position as a warp space crossroads point on the path to Terra. And this time, the cluster became like a mountain pass, not entirely dissimilarly to the fabled tale of the Spartan 300 warriors. This narrow position in space would become a killing ground into which both sides would pour men and apocalyptic war machines. Few battles in the history of humanity were as brutal or costly as those which occurred during the Beta Garmin campaign. It would eventually become known as Titan Death for reasons that are hopefully self-explanatory. It was initiated shortly after the dropsite massacre on Istvan V and became one of the largest ongoing engagements of the heresy. Taking place across hundreds of war zones and dozens of worlds, it was most notable for its heavy saturation of Titans, which while their use was of course not uncommon during this time, but within the Beta Garmin star cluster, saw significantly heavy deployments of the God Machines. Alpha Legion cruisers had entered the Beta Garmin star cluster, a region settled by humans during the Dark Age of Technology, and a region that survived the Age of Strife relatively intact. It made a peaceful and open transition into the burgeoning Imperium and was home to stable warp routes that enabled entry into the Sol system and Terra. 
For this reason, it was significantly important strategically. The Alpha Legion initiated their standard tactics of stealth and precision assassinations so as to destabilize the region, create fear and disruption in preparation for the Emperor's children to arrive. Elements of the traitor titans, the Legia Mortis, would also deal crippling damage to the Imperial Army and its orbiting star fort over Beta Garmin II. The ensuing confusion and power struggles caused by these initial actions would, as intended, lead many of the planets in the system to initially collapse, as was commonplace during the Heresy, resulting in most worlds descending into all-out civil war. Over a period of years, the traitors would bombard the planets without much concern for the consequences. Friend or foe, the dire events would inflict heavy suffering upon the civilian population and their defensive forces. Great starvation, soul plagues and the rain of plasma would all strike down upon ordinary individuals who simply were more often than not failing to know what was happening and trying to understand their place in these apocalyptic events. During the Heresy, Lorgar, Primarch of the Wordbearers, orchestrated a major warp storm known as the Ruin Storm. This was unleashed during the Battle of Kalth, and the goal of this was to divide and isolate Loyalist forces, while enabling traitor forces to still use the warp without issue, and this proved to be highly effective. In fact, the effect of this warp storm was so severe that Ultramarine's Primarch Robert Gulliman at one time considered Terra lost, and that as a result he would create his own auxiliary Imperium state the Imperium Secundus. So much for protecting the Emperor and the Imperium at all costs, I guess. The result of this massive warp storm on the Beta Garmin cluster was no less significant. It trapped Loyalist Marines and accompanying Titan assets in the region, who then had little option other than to do the best that they could with the resources they had, and assign themselves to defending Loyalist forces against worryingly increasing numbers of arriving traitors. Primarch Rogal Dawn would order a detachment of Imperial Fists to engage the Emperor's children at the massive garrison of Nurkon City on the now traitor-occupied Beta Garmin II. Across the planet and on the other worlds like Beta Garmin III, fighting continued on a mass scale, often involving Titan conflicts leading to many thousands of dead and Titans themselves lost or destroyed. After many months though, the traitor's stranglehold on Beta Garmin II and III would be broken. As the Ruin Storm weakened, it would allow for the first reinforcements to arrive to the Beta Garmin cluster, but would do little to give a significant advantage to either side, and if anything, the fighting only becomes more bitter and intense as more Loyalist human Imperial troops switch sides in the hopes of saving themselves as the traitors also continue to pour in their own reinforcements. Rumours surrounding Horus the Warmaster arriving spread like wildfire through planetary populations, and a vanguard fleet arrives to begin bombarding outlying worlds of the Beta Garmin Cluster. The damage that they inflict forces the hand of Imperial commanders to divide their efforts and in doing so reduce the defensive capabilities set up around the core worlds of Beta Garmin 2 and 3. As this initial period of assault begins to draw to a close, both sides would unknowingly enter what history would record as the second phase of the conflict. The reason for this differentiation being that while the initial stages of battle had already been intense, inflicting heavy losses on both sides, but things were now set to become even more devastating, and these early battles would seem like skirmishes by comparison. Legio Titans stood like true gods of war, towering over the primary Imperial Defence Forces. Imperial Fist's Primarch Rogal Dawn noted significant concern at the use of such behemoth machines of war, most especially in his mind that if they were to be used on terror, the Titans, while undoubtedly impressive war machines of apocalyptic stopping power, this was his very concern. That in fact Titans were so powerful, they were more often a danger to friendly forces, and indeed potentially their weapons were so powerful, they were a danger even to the planets themselves, such was the scale of their weaponry. Battles throughout the history of the Imperium are often devastating, but it cannot be overstated how massive the battles of Beta Garmin would be. You can start to form just something of an idea of the scale when you consider that on the Imperial side alone, they wielded something like 27 Titan Legions. That's legions, not individual Titans. These were joined by at least an additional 20 Imperial Night Houses, Mechanicum and Imperial Army Forces, plus elements of the Astartes, Blood Angels, White Scars, Imperial Fists and Salamanders. If such a concentration of force cannot be described as apocalyptic, then honestly what would be? Seeing all this is what concerned the ever-worrisome Dawn the most. 
This was one of the most concentrated battle campaigns in terms of power that had been seen, and the damage being inflicted concerned him greatly. He considered the terror would potentially have to suffer far worse later down the line. The traitors themselves wielded dozens of Titan legions and at least as many night houses. They had their own infantry traitor army as well as Astartes legions from the Sons of Horus, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers and Emperor's Children. Not long after his arrival, Horus would initiate a massive assault towards the now Imperial occupied Nurkan city on Beta Garman II. Traitor Imperial armies swept across the planet, assaulting Hive cities, while the traitor Titans broke a 100 km defensive line of Loyalist Imperial forces. Despite its formidable defences, the sheer scale of assault laid down by the Titans, blackening and annihilating those who tried to resist them, the very earth is cracked as they storm over mortal men who can barely comprehend what they witness. Anywhere their weapons engage turns the very sand to glass, their irresistible force shatters the defences of Nirkon and the city is opened for the traitors to pour in. The city is subsequently lost in very short order, not long after the planet itself is back in the hands of the traitors. Beta Garman III remains in loyalist hands as the Titan legions of the Novigard stand resolute despite bombardments and siege assaults by the Sons of Horus and the Iron Warriors. So Horus instead turns his attentions to the outlying planets, and the Loyalists can do little other than to throw whatever they have available into their defences, but the ensuing raids are disorganised bloodbaths. Beta Garman III would become the focus of a prolonged engagement now, as multiple Titan legions battle for control of the planet. So many vessels were destroyed orbiting the planet, that for a time, the remnants and debris raining down on the planet would actually become a problem for those on the surface, as these huge pieces of starship came crashing down into the surface. The Iron Warriors would engage the Loyalist Titans again, with the Siege Battalions at long range. Finally, the Dark Mechanicum would initiate a solar event, blinding the Loyalist Titans and their sensor systems. The Traitor Titan Legion of the Tiger Eyes would engage the Loyalists, who fight to the last. On the planet of Omega Garmin, Death's Head Titans discover Loyalist Firebrand Warhounds waiting for them, and it remains a battle barely spoken of among the Loyalists because of the devastation inflicted. Finally, though, arriving much later than expected due to the instability of the warp, the Blood Angels and the White Scars would arrive with their fleets. They set about immediately reassessing the situation, and Sanguinius the Blood Angels Primarch took overall command. Apparently under Rogal Dawn's leadership, things had been standing on a knife edge, but they would fare little better under the Blood Angels' lead. Traitor forces continue to pour into the region, and any grand strategies have now long since been abandoned. Many Loyalist Titan Legions are now heavily damaged or even crippled, and by now Titans are fighting over the ruined, liquefied corpses of other Titans. Its crews are exhausted, the god machines pushed beyond their limits. It has become a battle fought with every inch of ground bled over, every ounce of energy counted. The Beta Garmin campaign was a grinding and grisly affair, and no matter how you wanted to look at it, after many months it became all too clear that the traitors were slowly turning the tide. Loyalist reinforcements were arriving in an unpredictable way, making it difficult to properly reinforce and plan counter-assaults. Internal command structure issues were also becoming a problem, with Loyalist leading princeps refusing to work under the authority of other Legion commanders. The traitors cared little for such petty power squabbles, and by contrast they simply wanted to annihilate the Loyalists. Their sole authority was Horus himself. Back on Beta Garmin II, the Blood Angels and some 30 Titan Legions fought to capture the planet and retake it again for the Imperium. Despite their best efforts of orbital assault bombarding the planet heavily, most of the traitors suffered minimal damage, and despite their gargantuan force of Titans, they were countered by a force of equal size, heavily entrenched, waiting for them, Nirkon City. The ensuing battle involved anything like 1,000 Titans fighting across the now ruined and scarred landscape of Beta Garmin II. The sights seen and actions taken in such an engagement are difficult to do justice to, in words. The scale of the conflict and power of the giant war machines, like Elizabeta, the beginning of our video, describes them as being beyond the comprehension of ordinary citizens. But it's enough to say that the battle would define the campaign and be bleakly designated as Titan Death. Many legions will be exterminated forever, and formerly powerful legions are withered 
to a fraction of their former strength. By the end of it all, the hive cities of Beta Garmin II will be visibly burning from orbit and the vast battlefields could be walked across from one side to the other, never having set foot on the ground for all the bodies and ruined war machines. In orbit of Beta Garmin II, a vast star fort known as the Anvil would see its own internal conflict between the Blood Angels and the Sons of Horus, but the resisting force was far less than they had anticipated. With little time to spare, they realised it was a trap and evacuated in time to see the space station detonate. The volume of debris that came pouring down upon the surface of Beta Garmin II inflicted heavy damage upon the survivors of both sides. But it would soon be revealed that the appalling devastation and wholesale slaughter on Beta Garmin II had merely been a distraction. Horus and the traitor's real target was Beta Garmin III, for here served the astropathic choir, the Loyalist Communications Centre. The traitors would detonate in orbit a Vortex Bomb, one of the deadliest weapons to exist in the far future. Anything coming into contact with the Vortex tear is torn from real space and shredded as it's dragged into the warp itself. The result is to create a temporary hole in the caustic storms surrounding the world, and thus also knocking out the Void Shields protecting Caldria Primus on Beta Garment 3. Horus, along with his legion and 100 titans of the Legio Mortis, would now assault the city. While the Imperials had titans defending the city themselves, the Imperial army's defence was soon overwhelmed and Horus would succeed in his goal of destroying the Imperial communications centre. At this point, ruined and exhausted loyalists lose all hope. Some bomb their own cities, others trigger the destruction of the hives and their fortresses rather than see them fall to enemy hands. The Titans now similarly begin to destroy any structures of value, and Imperial forces are essentially raising their own worlds, burning them to the ground. The Loyalist forces are significantly demoralised. The Primarch Sanguinius and Khan accept most of their forces have been destroyed, and Beta Garmin III was now in the hands of the enemy, as well as their vital communication choir being broken or controlled by the traitors. Rogal Dawn's grand plan to hold the traitors and buy time had failed. Imperial Loyalists would retreat and withdraw from the Beta Garmin Cluster with any materials and manpower they could briefly gather while fighting running space and ground battles with the traitors. Horus, the War Master though, had secured a major victory in the Beta Garmin Cluster, not only securing the communications centre of the Imperium, but also the gateway to the Sol system itself, which would ultimately then lead to the Siege of Terror. A Pyrrhic victory for the traitors and a loss for the Imperials. When all was said and done, the casualties were beyond calculation on both sides. The civilian death count for both Loyalist and Traitor was at least in the billions. Titan legions were either exterminated or heavily crippled, with many thousands of god war machines and their operators destroyed. The scale of destruction left on the scarred and irradiated wasteland, its ashen citadels, worlds populated since the very first explorations of humanity during the Golden Age, now stood as dead worlds. It's likely no one will ever know the full record of the dead and the losses. The Beta Garmin campaign was one of the largest ever fought by humanity in the history of the Imperium of Man and suffered likely the highest destruction rate of Titans ever recorded. It was a bruising and humiliating defeat for humanity and the Emperor. Now if you didn't already know, Titan Death, like a great many Black Library novels, are available in audiobook form. Audible offers these audiobooks and gives a great deal of value as a service, and let me explain to you why. Firstly, you can start listening right now with a 30 day Audible trial, where you can choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Just visit audible.com slash Luton. Or for those of you in the US, text Luton to 500-500. Now, even if you wanted to just try Audible, this is a great opportunity to do so. 
I know that many of you who watch my videos already use Audible to listen to the amazing audiobooks of 40k because I read your comments and I asked you guys recently to tell me your experiences with Audible and you can see those on screen now. A great many of you have been telling me you use Audible to gain more knowledge and understanding of 40k and I also know that obviously many of you love listening to long format narratives at home, work and on the road. It's one reason why you're here on the channel and Audible makes new audiobooks affordable as members get 30% off standard prices for audiobooks. But also, unlike other offers which only feature old material, Audible has the newest titles from Black Library. This means that every month you can always be listening to the newest releases and stay up to date with the ever increasing pace of the 40k verse. When you sign up for Audible, you get one audiobook plus two Audible originals every month. And I already mentioned that Titan Death is a really good option, but my choice for a first month audiobook would also be Belisarius Call The Great Work. This is an amazing tale about the origins of Belisarius Call, and the details within this hold huge implications, I think, for the potential future developments in the Imperium. So it's really one that's worth listening to, and I highly recommend it. Now another title you might be interested in is of course Death Wolf. Now this is the short 30 minute battle narrative which talks about the assault upon my namesake planet, the Luton Necropolis, by the Dark Eldar and its defence by the Space Wolves. This was covered in my recent fan fiction, so if you're interested in learning more there, this is one to check out. Remember, once you're a member with Audible, you get a credit good for any audiobook regardless of the price and any unused credits will roll over for your next month. Members will save 30% off regularly priced audiobooks which gives you a significant saving on any titles that you pick up. I personally think Audible is a really great service to use, so if you want to get one free audiobook and two Audible originals, just check out the offer today at audible.com slash Lutin. Or again, for those in the US, you can text Lutin to 500 500 to get started today. Thanks as always for watching guys and all of the support that you have given to me and the channel for this year. I'll be back very soon with some new videos so as always I'll see you in the next one.